did we not have, didn't we not have a wonderful time this weekend? How many women, really, God shifted something? Amen? Amen. Amen. And it was just marvelous, and the Holy Spirit was just on it, right? And so I am just so grateful that we had this opportunity to host it. And, Gina, you really put a lot of prayer effort into it, initiative. And, and that, see, that was the key. It was really Holy Spirit run. Because you can have a conference, and then you can have a conference with the presence of the Lord. And that's what that was all about. It was just fabulous. So, uh, anyway, so thank you. And so thank, you, thank you. Thank you. But, uh, Gina, I know you know Chris for a long time. And I just thought maybe it might be good if you introduce him. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing honor to be a part of this church ministry, really. I love you guys. Um, so, yeah, Pastor Chris, <laughs> he's my brother from another mother. I say he says sister from another mister. But it's all the same to me. Um, we met when he brought me to Maui to do my second dream conference which was an incredible life-changing experience. And what I had said was that my DNA was actually changed by what I encountered there in Maui. But that's because I believe it's what he carries. So to have him here in our region and here, to me, is so significant. And I'm just... I've seen him. He, he's a, a faithful husband and dad, five girls, beautiful wife, <laughs> family first all the time, and carries that and also carries this worldwide ministry where he's traveling, you know, as much as he can to not be away from them for long periods of time. But he's really recognized as such a global voice of culture change. And he brings an amazing perspective. So I'm super honored to have you here. And he brought two team members, too, who have been awesome. So just receive, guys. Just receive what God has for you. I know it's going to be something that you've never received before. So Chris, you want to come on up? <laughs> How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Man, introductions are such weird things. <laughs> I always crack up. And the bigger the conference, the crazier the introduction is. And sometimes I just want to be like, no, don't say anything because now you're setting me up, you know? Now everybody's like, oh, it's going to be awesome. And what if I'm not awesome, you know? So, so you know, I'm like, holy ghost, you, it's just got to be you, you know? But Gina, Gina's my sister, man. I mean, this, this girl is like, we speak the same language. We just believe in the same things. And, uh, and I just want to take a minute just to say thank you again to Pastor uh, Peter, Pastor Trisha. You guys have been amazing. You have, you've been amazing. And, you know, it's one thing to be great pastors. It's another thing to be great people. And I think the greatest compliment I can ever give is that you're great people. And you're people I don't want to just do ministry with. You're people I can just sit down and talk to and laugh with. And, and just be friends with. And, and, and you guys have been amazing to me and to Cody and Pele who have come with me. And, uh, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, it's been incredible. Uh, you know, when you, travel, when you travel all the time, and people who travel all the time, you're going to get me when I say this, right? Um, the last thing you want to do is stay at people's houses, <laughs> especially ones that you don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's really the last thing you want to do. But they put these Holy Ghost-filled magical sheets on the bed. And I don't even know. I've never experienced anywhere in the world sheets like this. It, all I can compare it to is like if a mitten was a sleeping bag. I mean, I just felt like I was caressed by the hand of Jesus for the last two nights. I just did not want to get out of bed. And I'm not someone who's prone to sleeping a lot. And I just wanted to stay in bed. This morning was really hard. I mean, you just need to thank Jesus I'm here this morning. Because it was really tough to get out of bed. I mean, it was amazing. It's just beautiful sheets. I said the only thing that, the only thing that saves your sheets from being lost from your bed today is the fact that I live on Maui and these sheets would be too hot for my, my bed on Maui. But, I mean, outside of that, I mean, I would... I, I would steal the sheets. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. They're, 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 they're amazing. They're amazing. In fact, I showed Gina the sheets. Gina stayed over last night, and I showed the sheets. But before I showed the sheets, I said, I just want you to know, we're not switching rooms tonight. <laughs> 
So I showed her, I showed her the sheets and I kicked her out of my room. <laughs> Ten minutes later, she texts me. She says, hallelujah, I got the sheets too. <laughs> Man, 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 you guys are dope. Yesterday was such an awesome day. Yesterday was such an awesome day, and today was going to be a day. Not the drug dope. We're a drug-free, we're a drug-free church. Right? <laughs> he said, this is the dopiest pulpit I ever saw. That was a total compliment, but I'm thinking he's starting off on the wrong foot here, man. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I know. You know, most places I go to, they ask me if I want a headset mic or a handheld mic, and I tell them, if you want me to speak, give me a headset mic. If you want me to preach, give me a handheld mic. And I just spoke. I just was on a, a East Coast speaking tour a couple, couple weeks ago. This fall, this fall, up until September, uh, from the beginning of fall until uh, Thanksgiving, I'm home for like 11 days, right? And, and, uh, but I, I spoke at this amazing church in, in North Carolina. I told them that. I said, if you want me to speak, give me a headset. If you want me to preach, give me a handheld. So, so they just looked at each other. I got up to preach and I kid you not, I kid you not, they hand me this bright red mic, handheld mic, and I was like, wow, <laughs> like, oh, well, you don't want me to preach, you want me to preach fire, right, you want me to spit fire out of my mouth, all right, but, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> but, but, but the choice I was given today was, would you like to preach up or down, and I said, what's well, normal, I'll do whatever is normal, it's, it's fine, but I'll preach down, because I just don't feel like it's proper for me to ask to be elevated on a platform and preach at this pulpit. Like, there's just, I, I don't think I can do that, you know? It's, uh, I don't know who else can. I can. So I was like, well, I'm just going to stay down here, and I'm just going to, you know, be good with Jesus, and I'm just going to serve from down here. But, but I got a word for you today, and I hope that you, are, 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 you have come with open ears and open hearts for what God is going to do. You know, yesterday I got to talk a little bit about the destiny and the drudgery, but, but today I don't want to talk about any drudgery, okay? Because I don't believe that this church is, is, is headed for drudgery. I think this church is headed for destiny, and I really felt that in my spirit. And I, So today I want to talk to you guys about the movement for the moment, okay? The movement for the moment. And, and, and we, li- we, we serve a God who is never, ever, ever old-fashioned. Like, we serve a God that is the ultimate futuristic force, right? That he, he, he lives in the future. He lives at the end of time, and he talks to us from the end of all things, right? He talks to us from eternity. He's not living life with you and I in the past, present, and future. He's not living with us today on November 17th, 2019. He's, he, he's, he lives in the eternity time works different for him he doesn't serve time he's not constrained by time time is defined by him and it's constrained by him he controls time time doesn't control him so so when we understand that we understand that every moment that you're in and I talk a lot about moments because I believe that everything hinges on the moment that you're living in we talk a lot about the past we talk a lot about the future in church what we don't really talk a lot about is the present moment and how you live that present moment. I love that, that testimony by Chris. That was, that was amazing. Uh, that, that was amazing. You could have just preached today, and I, I'd have just high-fived you. I mean, that was amazing. That was a message in itself, right? Because what, what Chris found is that there's a difference between freedom and liberty. Did you know that there's a difference between freedom and liberty? Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast in the liberty for which Christ Jesus set you free. Whoa, wait, wait a second. So I'm fast in the liberty for which Christ Jesus set you free. So freedom wasn't the goal. Freedom was the vehicle to get me to liberty. And Paul says, don't stand fast in freedom. Stand fast in liberty. What's the difference? Freedom is a state of being. Liberty is an experience. If I'm sitting in a jail cell, Convicted of a crime. And somewhere up there in the courthouse, new evidence comes to life and they're having a hearing. And I'm sitting in that cell. And the judge looks at the new evidence. And he says, wow, this man is innocent. Set him free. How many of you know that in that instant, my situation didn't change. I'm still in the county orange in the cell. But one second, I was guilty. The next second. I was free. My situation hasn't changed. 
I haven't experienced it yet. But freedom is a state of being. But when the, the guard comes down, takes the key, unlocks the door, opens it up, and he says, you can go. And I walk out. I change into my street clothes, my normal clothes. I go home. I hang out with my wife. I play with my kids. I go out and I get a job. I get in a car and I drive around and I experience all of the properties of what it means to be free. That's liberty. And Paul says, be careful. Be careful not to get caught up in just a declaration of freedom while you still sit in the same cell with an open door. Never walk out. Never live it. But you sit in your cell with the open door and go, but I'm free. But I'm free. Jesus, but I'm free. Just set me free. How do I get free? Uh, but I'm free, God. I'm free, God. Even though I feel like I'm still trapped. I'm still addicted. I'm still uh, an alcoholic. I'm still yeah, I'm, I'm still struggling with depression. Even the, I, I'm going to sit in the cell. But Jesus, I'm going to live off the fact that I'm free. And you live that every day of your life. Paul says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. That's not why he set you free. Get out of the cell. Get up. Walk out. Put on your clothes. Wash your face. And live a life of liberty. And what Chris found, right, is that for 17 years, he tried to live off of freedom. But he got real freedom the day that he decided, I'm not going to live off of freedom. I'm going to walk in liberty. I'm going to change the way I act. I'm going to change the way I think. I'm going to change the way I live. I'm going to change everything about my lifestyle because when I do that that's the moment I step out of freedom into liberty and that's why Christ Jesus set me free yeah. that's not even the message I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 5 <laughs> Luke chapter 5 the moving for a moment I think that God is always doing something new God is always doing something new and when you serve a God who's always doing something new then that puts the onus on us as the body of Christ to keep up with him and historically in the the age we live in church is not really good at keeping up with God as God is moving I have been told over and over by science that there is no such thing as time travel. But I swear they're lying to me because I can walk into some churches and I feel like I went back 45 years. <laughs> I feel like I stepped into a time machine like Back to the Future and I just jumped right back into the 1950s. Sometimes I feel like I jumped back into the 1500s. We can't wrap our minds around God saving one of the biggest rappers in the world because we're still singing songs from 500 years ago. We actually believe God didn't write good music in the last 500 years. God's not trying to update us from five years ago. He's still trying to get us into this century. If you're really religious, I'm going to disclaimer, if you're really religious, you're going to be mad at me today. Because I think church culture is the funniest culture on the face of the earth. We do things that make absolutely no sense. <laughs> Stuff that the Bible don't even talk about. Yeah, I think it's just hilarious. I think it's a place that we're supposed to be selling something real but oftentimes the fakest two hours you'll spend any part of the week is the, is the two hours you spend in church like you'll put on clothes you don't wear during the week <laughs> I don't want to get the gift of smack today Pastor Tricia <laughs> I'm going to stand on this side <laughs> she has a long arm, huh? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to join this section over here. We, dre we put on clothes that we don't wear during the week. We do our hair up in ways that we don't. Well, some of us do our hair up in ways that we don't do it during the week. You stop using language that you use during the week. You put on smiles you don't wear during the week. You use language you don't use during the week. How are you doing today? Blessed. 
God knows that anybody else asks you that question during the week. You're like, oh, you wouldn't believe what my husband said to me yesterday. You wouldn't believe what happened to me. I was driving and, and, and you're just complaining all throughout the week. You show up on Sunday. In the car, you're complaining to your spouse. Oh, man, I just couldn't wait to get out of this week. I couldn't stand it. I'm just, I can't stand such and such. I can't believe I'm going to see them today in church. And, and then you step out of the car and then you're like, huh. And they're like, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm so blessed. My life, you know how it is. I can do all things through Christ who gives me shine. It's like, who in the world actually talks like that? Except in church. And if we wonder why people who are looking for something real come to church and they don't understand anything we're saying, they don't recognize us at all, even though they've seen us all week. And in a world looking for something real, it's no wonder our churches are dying. Because we advertise that we have something real. But what we offer them is something that's not. If we were a business like too many churches want to be, we would be indicted for fraud. And it is in this climate that the God of the universe who sent his only son to die for us still bleeds and cries for the hearts of people all over this world and he hasn't given up on it yet and it is in this world that there is a responsibility on us as the body of Christ to be an accurate representation of what he loves who he loves and what he wants to do on this earth. So Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 37. I want to I just speak to you for a few minutes. I got one big idea for you. I don't have a million points for you. I just have one big idea. I'm a one big idea guy. All right, I don't want you to take 52 points that you'll never read again, okay? I, I, I want you to go away with one, one real idea. And I want to preach you out of one of the verses I hate the most in the Bible, Pastor Peter. I hate this passage. And I don't hate it because it's scripture. I love the Bible. But I hate it because in charismatic circles, this is probably one of the most misused, misrepresented scriptural passages in the Bible. I hear it preached all the time, okay? I hear it preached all the time, but it drives me crazy. But I'm going to preach it. I'm going to preach it anyway. And I hope I can give you something new, all right? Luke chapter 5, verse 37 uh, through 39. I got three scriptures. And no one, everyone say no one. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. I would like to say that there, there is a translation out there that, that must have been more accurate in which uh, they, it says, and no one except churches put new wine in old wineskins. But I'm going to get to that later. For the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wines, new wine must, everybody say must must be stored in new wineskins but no one everyone say no one again no one who drinks the old wine here's the problem you didn't know this part was right after right no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine the old is just fine they say <laughs> you didn't know that one was in the bible jesus bursts on the scene He's different from every cat out there. Every other rabbi is old-fashioned. They're, they're, all they're doing is preaching the same thing that's been preached for centuries. And they have lost the heart of God in the scripture. And then all of a sudden, Jesus bursts on the scene. He's different from everybody else. He doesn't look like them. He doesn't come from, from the same lineages that you're supposed to come from. He's from, he, he's from Nazareth. And, 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 and he goes out and he does things different. You didn't, you didn't go out recruiting disciples in that day. It was beneath you. If anybody wanted to be your disciple, they had to come to you. Because you didn't need them. They need you. And then out of all of them, you all live in the heart of Ivy Leaf country, right? You don't take every applicant if you're a very reputable school. You want the best of the best. So the greater your school as a Pharisee or as a Sadducee, you would handpick the best ones for yourself, the ones with the right lineages, the ones that came from the right families with the right backgrounds, the, the sharpest minds. And then Jesus comes on the scene, 
Now, he doesn't make anybody come to him. He says, I'll go to you. I will find you where you are. And I'm not going to recruit the people with the right lineages and the right look and the right background. I'm going to find all the wrong people. I'm going to find the people that put the foot in the mouth. I'm going to, I'm going to find the people that run at the first sign of danger. I'm going, to, I'm going to find the people who do flunked out of school. I'm going to find the people who didn't come from the right family. Right? I'm going to find all of those dudes. I don't know if there's anybody here who, who can relate to any one of those kind of folk. But Jesus went and found those folk and said, I don't want to make you my disciples I want to make you my world changers and everybody was like who is this dude but there was something magnetic about him and people started gathering around him and at the beginning of Luke chapter 5 he calls his first disciples and his first disciple out of everyone he could have picked was a fisherman and it wasn't by accident. Everything Jesus did was intentional. And I know that he intentionally picked a fisherman to be first because to God, if you read the scriptures, everything God does first matters. There is a blessing on first. And the first guy he recruits, he knows, is going to be the first guy to preach the first message on the day of Pentecost. He finds that dude. But he says, I, I'm going to call you. But there's something about what you do and what your family does that you need to understand about being my movement. Because he doesn't say, I want you to leave being a fisherman. I, wanna, I want you to leave there and then I'm going to turn you into a preacher. He says, I'm going to teach you how to be a fisher of men. I'm going to take what you are and what you do that every other school out there says is unqualified. And I'm going to tell you, not only am I going to use you in spite of it, I'm going to use you because of it. You know what the greatest testimony is? The greatest testimony of your life is that there is nothing that you have done, nothing that you've been through, nothing that has been in your past that has created you to be who you are in this moment that God can't use to be your message. Paul stood on Mars Hill in the center of the world's religions, preached the gospel in which he used no scripture verses, and had one main point. The God of heaven does not live in a house made by human hands. One of the greatest truths of all time. Still to this day, we're still trying to figure that out because we still think the church is a house. The God of heaven does not live in a house made by human hands. This is the thing about Paul. Paul didn't come up with that concept. Paul heard it from somebody else and Acts records it. Because before Paul said that, decades earlier, there was a guy named Stephen who stood in front of the Sanhedrin with Paul standing as witness, ordering his execution. And on the day of Paul's most famous sin, his greatest black mark of his life, the day he committed a murder that would last for all generations, he heard that man, the man he murders, stand in front of the Sanhedrin and say, the God of heaven does not live in a house made by human hands, Acts chapter 7. Decades later, standing on the hill of his greatest message, he preaches from the truth he learned on the day of his greatest sin. There is nothing you have done. Woo, I got chill bumps. Nothing you have done. There's no, no mistake you've made. There's no regret you've lived with. That God needs to overlook for you to be the messenger he's called you to be. Stop hiding where you come from. Stop hiding what God has done in your life. Because your greatest mess becomes the core of your greatest message. You just got to let your mess age a little bit. Everywhere you look in the Bible, Jesus used the wrong dudes. The wrong dudes. To change the world. And so he explains to them. He says, I want to let you in on a little secret. 
Because God always wants to do fresh things. And I know I'm fresh to you right now. But God wants to do something greater than even me. But in order for you to understand how to always be in the center of the newest, freshest move of God, you need to understand this principle right here. New wine cannot be put into old structures or vessels. Sounds really good. We love that. And I hear churches preach this all the time. God sending us new wine in new vessels. The problem is we look like the same old church. Sorry, man. I'm not a preacher. I'm a truth teller. This is the truth. This is true. I mean, we might put better lights on it, a few more fog machines, nicer threads. And we keep saying, here, God, we're the new thing. And we think that just because it looks newer, it must be newer. But it's the same structure, the same sense. We're still singing the same three songs, offering and a message. We dressed it up nicer, but it's still the same thing. And God's looking and saying, man, you can put lipstick on a pig, but I ain't calling it a woman. <laughs> Who are you trying to fool? <laughs> and we think that just because we're so good at fooling everyone else around us, that we can actually gain God. But God's like, you can't fool me. If you want new wine, you can pray, you can jump around, you can run around and lapse around all you want till you fall on the floor, completely exhausted, praying for the reign of revival. But I'm going to tell you this, this principle was true then, it's true now. You can pray all you want for new wine, but new wine will not come unless God looks on this earth and he sees a new vessel. But to really understand the depth of this word, I got to give you a real quick Greek lesson. And Pastor Trisha is going to quiz you next week on it. If you fail, she'll lay her hands on you with the gift of smack. She's super anointed. I've learned that. When you read this, we read it in the English. Part of the limitations of reading the scripture in English is that the languages that the scripture was actually written in Hebrew, Greek, some Aramaic they're more nuanced languages than what we, we tend to use so where we might have one word for something in English that has many meaning, meanings right the Greek will have four different words with one meaning per word where we would just have one word with four definitions. And this verse is a perfect example of that limitation. The, probably the most famous one is love. We see the word love all over the Bible. And yet in the New Testament, there's four different words that are used. And depending on which word is used, that's what that word means. Jesus tells Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, I love you. Jesus asks him again, do you love me? Peter goes, yeah, I love you. The third time Jesus goes, do you love me? And Peter gets exasperated and says, you know I love you. Now, when I read that, it just seems all so simple, kind of confusing. Like, what's, why does he ask him the same thing three times? Until you realize those are different Greek words. And when he asks Peter, he says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love him? Peter says, I philo you. I filio you. I love you like my brother. Friendship love you. Jesus asked him again, do you unconditionally love me? Do you agape love me? Peter answers again, I feel you I love you. I love you like a brother. The third time Jesus goes, do you follow me? Do you love me like a brother? He, he, come, he brings it down and says, I'll take what you can give. And after having answered the first time, I follow you, I feel you, you, Peter answers, you know I can love you like that. And this is the crazy thing about Jesus. If I'm looking to promote somebody, because he's looking to promote Peter to the leader of the church, right? 
and I say, this is my standard, and the guy keeps saying, no, I can't meet that standard. I can meet you here. I would just be like, you're not qualified. John, come here. I got a question for you. <laughs> hey, John, come over here. You, you were my mom. You're probably better qualified anyway while Peter was like, oh, you know. But he doesn't. He meets him to the best of what he could give. And he still gives him the keys to the kingdom. I don't know who here just feels completely unqualified to be who God's called you to be. I don't know why we keep hitting these beats, but there's somebody here who just feels completely unqualified to be used by God or to be loved by God. And I want to tell you, that is absolutely categorically not true. The power of Romans 8.28, God can take all things and work them together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, is that all things kind of encapsulates the good, the bad, and the ugly. And God can take all of that, and he weaves them together. Remember, Paul is a tent maker, and that verb there where he says works it together is a tent maker term where you would take fabrics and you would weave them together to form a dwelling place or a shelter. And he'll take all your good, all your bad, he'll weave them together to form you into a dwelling place for God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? But in this passage here, when we see new wine and new wineskins, it's not two words used, uh, uh, one word used twice. They're two words used once. And it's important that we understand it if we're going to get this concept because I believe that God wants to do something new. And I believe, just having stayed with your pastors, they're ready for the new. Now the question is, are you ready for the new? That word new, when it says new wine, is the word neos. Neos. And neos is a word we kind of think of when you think of new. It kind of sounds like new, right? If you watch The Matrix, right, when, 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 when Thomas Anderson, you know, gets pulled out of The Matrix and he's given his new identity, they name him Neo, Neos, right? That's what we think of, of like new, brand new. But Neos actually doesn't mean that. Neos means newer, fresher, or younger. It is a newer, fresher version of the same kind. Okay, in other words, the best way that I can put it is when you take a glass of water and you make it at night and you're going to drink it, but you forget about it, you go to bed. When you wake up the next morning and you're thirsty, if you're like me, you don't drink that glass of water because you never know what, what climbed into it while you were sleeping at night. Some of you just nasty. You're just looking all guilty. You're like, I drink it. I drink water. I've been sitting now two days. I don't even know whose water. I didn't even pour the glass. I don't even know whose water that was. But nobody touched it for two days. I decided to drink it, you know. <laughs> but you, 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 don't, you don't drink it. What I do is I pour it out, and then I rinse out the glass, and I put in a fresh glass of water. I drink that. Same substance, fresher. And so when he talks about the wine, he's not saying, I'm going to give you a wine that you have never received before. In the Bible, Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the ultimate word of God. I mean, scripture is the word of God, but scripture is the word of God like Jesus is the word of God. Like if I, took a, if I took a bottle and I poured it into the ocean and I said, this is the ocean and the ocean itself, right? Scripture is like the ocean. It's like the word of God, but like a very limited version of it, right? You can learn stuff from it, but you can't swim in it, right? right? And, and, and so, and so like that Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the ocean, right? I live on a rock in the middle of the ocean. You can't see the end of it. It is endless. And there's no way you can get the scope and the grandness of the ocean from a bottle of water holding ocean water, right? You can never get the fullness of Christ from the scripture. That's why the Pharisees knew more scripture than anybody else stood this close to the son of God and murdered him. Because they're not the same, right? And so Jesus is the word, and, and, and Paul talks about the water, the washing of the word of God, like water. So the water is representative of the word of God, ultimately Jesus, the living water, right? But, but wine is representative of the Holy Spirit. 
And the way some of us, even with the Holy Spirit living in us, still cry out for Jesus every day, you think that Jesus turned the wine into water, not the water into wine. Jesus was the water, his first miracle, because remember first, his first miracle was turning water into wine. Why? Because he was giving you a picture of what he was about to do. But the way we treat Holy Spirit, we treat Holy Spirit like he's junior God. He's a demigod. Father is up here. We pray to him all the time. Jesus is up here. He's my Savior. I love him. We completely ignore the one person in the Trinity who's just as much God as the other two. The one who's actually on earth with us. And the way that we pray and we live and we act, it is evident that the church does not believe Holy Spirit is enough. We always are looking for new moves of God that the world has never seen. But God gave us 2,000 years ago the ultimate force, the ultimate God of the universe, and he put him in you. Do you understand what that means? I don't need a brand new substance. I don't need a new version of God. When he filled me with Holy Spirit, that is all I will ever need. But I constantly need to be refreshed. And God says, I want to constantly make sure that your stream of flow of Holy Spirit, that you will never be in lack, you'll never be in want, you'll never be burnt out, because as much as you give out, you're pouring back in, because every time you pour out what you have, a fresh wine is flowing into you, and my source is greater than your needs, so there's no way you can push out and pour out more than what I'm pouring into you. If you get it but the problem the reason why we're a dead sea instead of a jordan river the reason why we're pushing out and everything is pooling and dead because we're not we're, we're not uh, uh we we just don't we don't have two different flows coming in and out is because either we're not giving out so we're just receiving in all the time or more likely we keep trying to fit fresh moves of God into our old mindsets and our existing lifestyles. Some of you are asking God for freedom from addiction. He says, stop hanging out with your boys that you grew up with. And you go, no, I love them. So you keep the friends and you wonder why new freedom is not coming into your life because you can't stick a fresh move, fresh freedom into your old ways of thinking. Neos, fresh. But when he says new wineskins, that's a whole different word. That word is not neos, it's kainos. Kainos means something completely different. Kainos means brand new, unheard of, never seen before. You got to catch this. You got to catch this. You got to catch it. Brand new unheard of never seen before see what we keep asking God to do is we keep asking God to give us a fresh or, or, or brand new unheard of never seen before move and we keep trying to put him into fresher newer useful versions of the same thing we've been doing we are trying to get a kainos move into a neos vessel and wondering why our prayers are not working and we're not seeing new moves of god it's because jesus is saying no 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 you got it all wrong you can't get a kainos move and stick it into a neos vessel you got to ask for a neos move but you got to give me a kainos vessel it, that puts the onus on us that if we want to be a fresh move of God, then King of Kings, you got to figure out how to be something that this region has never seen before. But that's tough. You know why that's tough? Jesus knew we were going to struggle with this. 
So he, he tells us why we're going to struggle with this. He says, because no one who has already drank the old wine ever wants the new wine. Because they say the old was just fine. You know why we're going to struggle to be the move of God for tomorrow? Because the wine of the move of God of today was so good. Or yesterday was so good. That's why churches are always trying to get back to the good old days. The good old days of our life. God's not trying to do Azusa all over again. Get that out of your brain. This is great awakening country, right? Whitfield country. They, look, God's not trying to do a great awakening all over again. Those moves have passed. Those were the movements for the moment in that time. But God wants to do a movement for the moment today. But for us to be the movement of the moment for today, somebody's got to give him something that the world has never seen before. Somebody's got to say, hey, I'm not going to go by the traditions of the past. I'm not going to do it like I was always told. I'm not going to do it the way the denomination I grew up telling, telling me to do it did it. I'm going to seek the heart of God. And whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. Because I'm not just a believer. I'm not just a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus where you you lead me I will follow I will go to uncharted territories I will do crazy things that the world will look at me and say I'm a lunatic but I'm gonna see the dead rise I'm gonna see the sick be healed I'm gonna see the possessed be freed I am going to be the kind of vessel you are looking for somebody's got to break out of the mold somebody's got to dare to be different somebody's got to dare to be creative and innovative like the spirit of God is somebody's got to get tired of doing the same thing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and somebody's got to say I am I am ready I'm ready to be something that New Jersey looks at and goes man I went to church my whole life but I have never seen a church like that what is that when is going on I got to be a part of that I got to get in there I can't wait to get in the presence of God they got something new I don't know what that means for you. I don't mean, I don't know if that means the curtain's got to change or your heart's got to change. I don't know what that means. All I know is that God is dying to get a fresh move into his people, but he keeps looking around and he doesn't see any vessels worthy of that wine. I'm tired of prayer meetings where we keep begging God to give us fresh moves as if it's his fault we don't have it. As if somehow he doesn't love us as much as we love our people. God, why don't you send us another move? I'm crying out to you. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Not for the harvest. Stop praying for the harvest. Harvest is everywhere. You probably walk by. A hundred people every single day in the supermarket and wherever you're going. You probably sit next to the same ten people that you sat next to for the last ten years. And ain't none of them saved. And while you pray for revival, you're the hands and feet of Jesus. You're sitting next to the same person for ten years. They don't even know what church you go to. And then we keep coming to prayer meeting. Crying out to God saying, why aren't you sending revival? He did. He says, pray that the Lord of the heart, to the Lord of harvest, that he would send the laborers out into the field. If we don't see a move of God, the problem is not with harvest. The problem is with lazy laborers. <laughs> it's true. I just read the Bible for what it actually says. Not what I wanted to say.
So Jesus tells them this. He says, I'm going to make new vessels. And if you want to know that this isn't a new thing Jesus is sharing, this is something that's always been the principle of God. In Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says that when the earth was formed, there were no trees, no shrubs, no fruit. Because everything was in seed form in the ground. Because God had not yet sent the rain. Because there was nobody on earth to tend to the harvest. God will not send rain anywhere where he doesn't see someone or something that can, har that, that can steward the harvest. God is looking in New Jersey right now saying, I'm ready to send rain. I'm looking. Where's the Kainos vessels who can handle this? Where are they? The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro. Looking for what? Looking for those with hearts what? After him. He's looking all over the earth. Saying where are those with hearts like mine? Where are those who are willing to go where I'm going? I'm not in the past. I'm in the future. Where are the people who will stop looking back and will look forward? Did we not hear Jesus say those who take up the plow and look back are not fit? Why do we keep looking back? Well, we should be looking forward. So Jesus says, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to do something crazy. He tells his disciples, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. We think that's heaven. Every time I hear it, I hear it at a funeral. Which is really weird because when Jesus said that, I go to prepare a place for you, he wasn't going to heaven. He was going to the cross. So why do we keep applying that to heaven? When he wasn't trying to comfort them that because he was going to heaven. He was trying to comfort them because he was about to make the sacrifice. He says, where I'm going, you're going too. He wasn't talking about heaven. He was going to the cross the next day. But what he was saying was, I'm going to the cross in me, in my father's house. I wish I could, I had time to do this, this to just break this down for you. My father's house is only used two times in scripture, both times in John, when a writer uses a specific phrase and he's the only one who uses it. It means something specific. And in John chapter 2, when he uses it for the first time, he's talking about his body. He says, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. But then later on, he explains that he wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about himself. In me are many dwelling places. And he goes to the cross. Why? He's the bread of life. Everywhere that bread is broken in the Bible, it multiplies. Everywhere. If you have the 5,000, you name it. It, it, it multiplies. And instead of one person eating it, everyone consumes it. The bread of life went to the cross, was broken, multiplied. And made us all the dwelling place for the Spirit. And the reason why he did this is because if you want to understand... Jesus' ultimate work in you. And this is how I'm going to close today. To understand the fullness of Jesus' work, you just have to understand one thing, how a bridge works. See, the thing about a bridge is a bridge, it connects two disconnected places. It touches both, it is both, but it's neither at the same time. So a bridge between the United States and Canada, part of it touches Canada, part of it touches the U.S. It's both, but it's neither. And when sin entered the world, it created a separation between heaven and earth. A chasm. No one could connect. So to bridge heaven and earth, God and man, the separation that sin created, the bridge would have to be both heaven 
and earth. It would have to be both God and man. God couldn't just sweep down and undo it because he gave authority to human beings. So if anything is going to be done on the earth, it has to be done by a person. That's why when the enemy wanted to sabotage God's creation, he couldn't just come down and do it. Who did he have to go through? A person, Adam and Eve. So when God came in the form of man, Jesus, for the first time ever, there was a heaven-earth being. There was a God-man. Fully God, fully man, the bridge. And he came to reconnect heaven to earth, God and man, by being the God-man bridge. But he realized that the end game was much bigger. Because he didn't come to just save humanity. Paul says that creation groans because Jesus came to save creation. Human beings are not the only ones affected by the fall. Creation itself. But to unwind the clock of creation's deterioration, he was going to have to get heaven down to earth. Heaven is infinitely big. But when Jesus stepped into his humanity, he put aside some of the attributes that made him infinite and became finite. So when you have a finite bridge trying to pass infinite things through, just like when you try to get a ton of cars on the New Jersey Turnpike during rush hour, what happens? You bottleneck, right? So Jesus goes, man, I, I want to get heaven to earth. So I could stay on earth and I could be the bridge forever. It would just be me. But it would just be heaven coming through the bridge of one person. But if I go away, it's better because then I can send you Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because, see, when, when he went to the cross, he went to make dwelling place for us because his end game was to get Holy Spirit in us. It wasn't for him to stay here forever. He said, I'm going to save you by making you the dwelling place, the temple of God, of, of the Holy Spirit. And when I send you the Holy Spirit, he lives in you. Listen to this. Get this. This is the one big thing. When you, when you have Holy Spirit in you, Jesus was God in flesh, the bridge. You and I are flesh. We can't be the bridge. But when Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, you are flesh. He is God. Jesus is God in flesh. Holy Spirit in you is God in flesh. In you, I don't think you get it. I don't think you get it. Jesus was God in flesh. I can never be the God part. Jesus was the God part in flesh. That's why he could do what he did. I can't die for sins. He did. But you, with Holy Spirit in you, you are flesh with God in you. You become the bridge of heaven to earth. Now, all of a sudden, Holy Spirit fills in the other half of the bridge. And everywhere you go, heaven goes. Everywhere you go, heaven goes. Everywhere you go, heaven passes through to earth. Everywhere you go, healing passes through to earth. Everywhere you go, deliverance passes through to earth. Everywhere you go, joy passes through to earth. Everywhere you go, peace passes through to earth. Everywhere you go, the anointing passes through to earth. What are you doing waking up every single morning, feeling like you're nothing and you're nobody, that you have no purpose in life, when the God of heaven made you the bridge that connects heaven to earth? Do you know what the movement of the moment is, King of Kings? Do you want to know what the movement of the moment is? It is the moment when every one of us understands that you don't have to be part of the movement. You are the movement. You are the move of God for your generation. You are the move of God for your family, for your friends, for everyone around you. There's a day coming. Where you won't try to bring your co-worker to church on Sunday so the pastor can preach a message so they can be saved. There's a day coming where you're going to pull them in the break room, give them a word from heaven, and you're going to lead them to Jesus right there. And then when they come and become a part of King of Kings, they're not coming here because they're trying to get saved. They're coming here because you're introducing them to the family that they never knew they had. There's a day coming... When you won't have to bring your addicted family members 
to an addiction program for deliverance, you're just going to lay your hands on them. they will jump off. You know why God had Jesus call the most unqualified people on the earth to be his first disciples? Because he wanted to send a message that there is no one who is unqualified to be the bridge from heaven to earth. That all you need is him. And you might be a bridge that's two feet, two feet long trying to cover a hundred feet. But he says where you're weak, as far as you can go, you give me what you got. Holy Spirit will fill in the rest. If you got two feet, I'll be 98 feet. If you got 20 feet, I'll be 80 feet. If you got 50 feet, I'll be 50 feet. But whatever it is that you need, if you're six inches, I'll be 99 and a half feet. I will take you for what you got, and I will use you to bring heaven to earth. But this is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to do. I don't put neos wine in anything less than a kainos wine skin. Not because he's prejudiced. If you read it, it's not just about not ruining the wine. It's about not breaking the skin. Sometimes God doesn't give you what you want. Not because he's rejecting you, but because he's trying to save you. Because you can't handle it yet. But every one of us is called to be the move of God. Paul casts a vision in Ephesians chapter 4 in which he says that we will grow in maturity and we'll grow into him who is the head a body proportionate to the side of the the size of the head it carries not as the pastor creates the vision not as pastor peter and pastor trisha become who they're supposed to be in christ he says as every joint supplies and every part does its share. If you're more comfortable being a spectator than a participant, and if you're here to consume instead of create, no amount of prayer meeting will help King of Kings be everything it's called to be as long as we sit on the sidelines and watch. It's true. This is true. And the most beautiful thing is when we participate in the kingdom, it's us who gets the greatest benefit. I thought I was going to law school. But God found me as a 15-year-old junior in high school and said, you're going to follow me. And you're going to stop. You're, it's not that you're not going to do what you thought you were going to do. You're just going to do it for a different client. And instead of making a case for corporations, you're going to make a case for Christ. He made me how he made me. But he showed me my purpose. And this bullied kid couldn't get a date for most of my high school life. I got a gorgeous wife, five gorgeous kids. The girl was homecoming queen, valedictorian, and first team state of Louisiana point guard. Like, I, I literally, I didn't marry up. I married, like, way, way up. <laughs> way, way up. And she's a lover of God. Yesterday, yesterday was her birthday. I turned this down. I turned this down because I don't travel on her birthday. But because Gina's my homegirl, Gina, she's part of our family. Stacy goes, what do you mean you turned it down? I say, it's your birthday. She goes, that's Gina. You don't, you don't turn that down. No, you're going to go. I said, well, 
I've been away all fall. And, and I feel like they need to hear our voices. Stacy goes, I'll preach. Because that girl can preach. And she said, I'll preach. I said, that's your birthday weekend. That means, that means you're going to be studying. You're going to be, you're going to have to take some of your birthday. And she goes, no. This is, this is our life. Following Jesus is the best decision you could ever make. So if we could just get the worship team real quick. Or just a keyboard player. It, it can be whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just whatever. I'll rock it what you give me. God is moving right now. There are new moves happening all over the earth. Five years ago, I got to, God asked me to found or plan a church. And I said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I sat down with my wife and I and eight other people in, in my living room around my coffee table. And I put every textbook that I still had from Bible college and seminary, and I took all the denominational handbooks and all these things that I had accumulated from church planting and denominations, and I put all of these different strategy books that I'd read and all of these things, and I looked, and I, and I looked them in the eye, and I said, I want to come to you with a proposition, and this is what I'm going to propose to you. I say... We forget everything that we've ever learned. And I dramatically just took my arm and swiped everything off the coffee table clean. I said, I want us to forget everything we've ever been taught about church planning. Most of us have been pastors in different churches. I said, I want you to forget everything anyone ever told you about how it's done or anything like that. And I want to propose to you that we follow one blueprint and one blueprint alone. And I took my Bible, it was opened up to Acts chapter 1, and I put it down on a coffee table. And I said, I want to propose that we follow this blueprint and we live by one rule and one rule alone. Whatever God says to do, we do because that God in the Bible he did really crazy stuff because he could find people who were crazy enough to do it but then I, I look today and God is the same yesterday today and forever but the people have changed we don't have those same passions anymore and the ones that do they're doing amazing things incredible things around the earth I don't want to watch them do it I want to be a part of it too I hear about what's happening with the church in China. I know we don't have the same persecution they do. But, 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 but God's not a respecter of person. He's not only giving the good miracles to them and not to us. But their hunger is different because their life depends on it. My life doesn't depend on it. I live in America my whole life. I have no idea what it means to lay down my life for Christ. And in a culture in which there is no demand... If we really want to move of God, we're going to have to find a way to generate a supply of kainos vessels, passionate pursuit that does not rely on a demand because we just don't have that demand. I think there's a new model building. I compare the megachurch movement of today to dinosaurs. They're big. They're monstrous. They dominate the landscape. But something happened with dinosaurs. The same size that made them so dominant and their presence so dominant wherever they were. When the climate around them started to change, they had no ability to adapt to that changing climate. And I'm watching our climate change. And we're struggling to fill our big auditoriums that we sold our souls to. So just like 
the dinosaurs. He would imagine was in smaller animals and all of those things. Whether you believe it or not, you know what I'm talking about. I was sharing with Pastor Trisha, I said, I think the next move of God is, it's going to be less like a dinosaur. It's going to be more like a herd of buffalo. One buffalo is much smaller than a dinosaur. But I believe that God is taking us back to the community of God again. The way that it was in Acts. Families doing life together. Each one of us, each one of our gatherings, it might be 10 people, it might be 15 people, but this is the community I do life with. Each one is a buffalo. But unlike house churches today in which you become lone buffaloes running around by yourself and you get killed off by every predator that comes your way, there is a unified church movement that's happening. That's not going to be mega churches, it's going to be mini churches, but the mini churches are going to be a herd. It's not going to be my little thing, your little thing, your little thing. Uh, we're all mad at each other. We're all mad at the church. We're all rejected. So we don't have any. So five years ago, I said, let's, let's just do that. So I lead this thing called the movement. It's just called the movement. It's starting to spread nationally now. And it's just, we call them communities because home, house church is a loaded term. So we call them communities. We have community pastors. I actually do not pastor a single person in the movement. I lead the movement. I don't pastor any of the people. We have pastors for that. I'm a pretty bad pastor, actually. You don't want me trying to nurture you. I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, one meeting. I'm good for one meeting. Good for one meeting. That's it. But we have amazing pastors who's, who are gifted. Who don't care about going around the world, don't care about standing on top, uh, in front of platforms or anything like that. They just want to take care of the people of God. True shepherds. And they pastor the people. And my job is to keep us unified. One vision. One move, one family. And I believe that God sent me here not really to preach as much as to unify and ask you a question. I told God this year, I didn't want to go to random places. I wanted to go to places that I felt like I was sent or that you would send me, God, that were at the, at just right at the tipping point of change or transition or transformation. And that's all he's done for me this year. So I know that you're at that place. So I just want you to stand up with me. this podium real quick. Thank you. Pastor Peter, Pastor Tricia, would you stand right here in front of me? I get invited to do prophetic stuff. I don't know why. I'm not like the prophesy to everybody kind of guy. Um, I think the prophetic manifests much more in my messages than they do in anything like that. But and I don't know that I actually have a real word for you guys. Except that I know that innovation is not age restricted. And that God has been reawakening the innovators in you again. He started this by innovating, just kind of create, going wherever he's leading, sometimes not knowing why or where. But something happens the longer we go and the deeper we go. And I hear God say, I'm shaking everything that can be shaken because the God of heaven does not live in a house made by human hands. 
He's calling out the creator and the innovator in you again. But you know this. That's why my word's not really for you. I'm just affirming this publicly what God is doing. Because the word is actually for you. God is raising a people who are willing to go wherever the river flows. It's going to look different. It's going to seem different. I run every message I preach and everything I do. You might think this is crazy. I run it by my teenage daughters. You know why? Because the world belongs to them, not me. Advertisers on TV, they're not trying to convince me to buy anything. They're trying to convince them. Every social media ad is targeted to them. Oh, you can stand right here. Yep, right here. No, no, no worries, no worries. It's like Simon says, but like Chris says, you know, it's like just, there's, the world belongs to them. But that is a generation that the church is losing in greater numbers. So listen to me. The church is losing the generation that the entire world has given culture to. That means if the church is going to reach the now generation, the generations that fill up the church that are not them are going to have to be willing to be the bridge between heaven and that generation. That means you're going to have to touch that generation. That means there's some things that are going to have to happen. Some changes that are going to happen that you're probably not going to like. I'll just be honest. You're not going to like it. It's not for me to decide where King of Kings goes. You have amazing leaders right here. Man, they're amazing. So I don't have a real individual altar call. This is one of those things that I think is a covenant you make with God. And he says, if you build my house, I'll build your house. So whatever individual things you're hoping I pray for you today, your answer is not going to be found in me meeting an individual prayer. It's going to be when you decide to submit your individual liberty to the corporate responsibility of the kingdom. So this is what I want to ask as a prophetic act. I don't know where King of Kings is going. I'm super excited to see it. But if you are behind your leaders and you say, I will choose to trust them. And I want to tell you this. I've said this all over the country. If you do not feel this way, I am not pressuring you. Some of you may in this moment be feeling like, mm, I don't know, maybe I'm praying about where I go. Do not feel like you have to come. This is not what I'm asking for. But if you are standing here today and you say, I am ready for the kainos. I'm ready to be the kainos because I want to see the neos. And I am ready to put my lot in behind my leaders. Wherever God leads them, I'll go with them. I'll support them. I'm not going to gossip about them, not murmur about them. But I'm in it to win it. If that's you today, I want you to file in behind your leaders. This is the only altar call you're going to get today. Now, if you're around Pastor Trisha, Pastor Peter, just, you can just put your hands, just lay your hands on them. And then if you can't reach them, just put your hands on the person in front of you. And we're just going to all connect real quick. I love this. This is kingdom right here. Like this, right here. This, this, right here. This is the movement for the moment. This, this is what it looks like. We are going to be the generation that reverses 
the reputation the church has gotten as the most gossiping, divisive, hateful people on the face of the planet. And we are going to be the generation that reverses that. Not by compromising with the world's ideals, but by G being Jesus and being the bridge that connects them to him. That's it. But because he doesn't put new wine in, new, in old wineskins, every one of you that just stepped up here today, you just gave God an invitation to shake you up. I want you to know this. You just gave him an invitation to mess your world up. When you step out of here today, God's not going to give you stuff on a silver spoon. He's going to begin to ask you for things because covenant starts with you. He always fulfills his part. The sum of you that know God's called you to fill in in children's church, but you like your sleep in the morning. God might ask you for that. Some of you, that relationship that you're in, that you settle for just because you don't want to be lonely, but you know it's not going to go anywhere. God just might ask you for that. Those secret habits that you have, God might ask you for that. Your bad attitude. Your inability to forgive. Your desire to hold grudges. God might ask you for that too. Because what he's doing is he's saying this. These are the old things. I need you to break off. I need you to take on some new habits, some new lifestyle so that I can pour my fresh move into you. So if that's you today, I want you to just close your eyes and say, Lord, today I make a commitment to be the new, to be the kainos. Whatever you have to do, Whatever I have to give, whatever I have to be, to be your kainos, that's what I'll be. And that's what I'll do. Give me the faith, the courage, and the conviction to choose you over everything else in my life. Because I know as I take on new habits, New thinking, new lifestyle, new faith. You will fill me. You will fill us with your glory. Mm. Father, today I just speak amen over every single one of the yeses. And I just speak over you, King of Kings. You will live up to your namesake in this region. And through you, the King of Kings will be seen over Manhattan, over all the kingdoms of the world. I'm about to be your cloud by day and your fire by night. You are about to leave the Egypt of where you have been and you're about to make your journey through the wilderness. Do not be disillusioned by transitions, by stopping places, by moments as they happen. Trust me. Don't try to predict where you're gonna land or what it's going to look like because if you do you will undershoot me because I'm looking all over the earth for anyone who would just be willing to embrace the kainos thank you God for everything that you're doing on this earth thank you that you're just raising us up to be able 
to be used by you, whether we're on Maui or in Jacksonville or in Long Beach or in Basking Ridge. You find us, you call us, and you use us to change the world. We just give you glory and honor for what you are about to do and what you have already begun in this region. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. That stepped up. We love you. I'm just a guitar player, but I'm trying to lead the ship. And uh, it's exciting, you know. Abraham went not knowing where he was going. So we got to have courage. Can we give Chris a hand one more time? How many would like to have him back? How many would like to have him fly us all over to Maui and we could go to his show? <laughs> I think it's more likely that we'll have him back. <laughs> but we just pray a blessing over you that you will leave here filled with his, the Lord's presence and power. Uh, are we good with prayer today? Yes, yeah, so we will have a prayer ministry at the front. You can come up that aisle. And um, I just bless you to go and thank you for your support.